some people who've missed several labs, so that is what kills you people. Not several, I mean, I mean, but don't miss any more labs. Anybody. Right? I don't, I'm, I don't know who it was. I'm not picking anybody in particular, so I just noticed that there was a lot. Okay, where do we stop on here? I have this on Streptococcus. Yeah, we didn't get very far off. Right here. Yeah, we have Streptococcus pneumonia. Pneumonia, okay. Yeah. We'll go through a couple of these, then we'll take the last 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. but, okay. But if you have any. Yeah, we stuck on it's um, pathogenesis and etymology. We just finished that slide, so the one we left off would be that yeah, 60. Yeah. Very visual. Ugh. Nice. 60. I hope that you go on a date and have him smile. I was just thinking. Or her, I guess. Did you date him? Did I tell us? 2018. So what I want you guys to remember about pneumonia. What I want you guys to know about pyogenes. What is the code? What are beard ants group? What's the one thing I want you to know about the beard ants group? Did you add that one? Yep. Okay, sorry. Um, one cause of dental caries is the dental flax. Good. That's the one I want you to know there. The dental caries and the dental flax. That's one of the ones. Okay. Strep pneumonia, like I said, pretty straightforward. It causes pneumonia. Okay? Mm -hmm. Nothing too sneaky there. A lot of these will be easy to get to them because the disease is, the organism is named after the disease it caused, right? But the other pneumonia is going to cause pneumonia. <coughs> All right. So, oh, we did get to this one, didn't we? So the only one you remember about strep pneumonia is it's, it's encapsulated. <coughs> so it's a polysaccharide capsule, which means it's going to be able to do what? What does the capsule do? It helps um, with protection, like, and um, being detected. Okay, so what? Attachment. No, that's more of a slime layer. They can be capsules, but those aren't the main two. Capsules are going to be what? They. You're, you're right. Just kind of the wording was a little bit. Okay, kind of so they, like, helps it not to get, like, recognized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They can get us. Okay, so it's, it, they can hide from the immune system, yeah. so recognition. And anti-phagocytic. They just can't get, they can't grab a hold of them. Does anybody remember the term oxidization from immunology? Take that as a note. <laughs> okay, I want to go over it real quick. One thing the capsule can do is you got a bacteria, right? It's got this capsule around it, so it can't be granted, it can't grab macrophages, you can't grab a hold of it. Phagocytosis. One thing the immune system can do is it can make antibodies. To this capsule. Okay? That's the essence of that seeds work. And then macrophages actually have a receptor for the antibody. Does that make, did we get that? So what's going on here? You make an antibody against the capsule, the antibody sticks to the capsule. The macrophage has a receptor for the other side of that antibody. So it can now grab that antibody and do what? It's got like a handle. And it's called obstinization. Okay? You probably need to know that. Stimulates, phago, uh, stimulates phago cells to be phagocytosed by the bacteria. We talked about some of these. Actually, live inside of the cells. Mediates binding the epithelium. Don't worry about that. <coughs> know this one too. Secretes a protease, IgA protease. That protease degrades IgA, which is what antibody? Where do we say that antibody usually is found? Mucus. Mucus membrane. So that's all going to be all your epithelial linings, everything, right? So one of the things is trying to grab this and hold on to it and get rid of it or opsonize it, it's now being broken down. Is 
that capsule around it right there. Um, the disease, what's the disease? Pneumonia. Pneumonia, that's the main one. It can also cause sinusitis, hepatitis, media, that one. Bacteria, and carditis. Again, bacteremia means what? Bacteria in the blood. In this case, what's happening with the bacteremia and endocarditis? It's going into like the blood is being pumped into the blood. Right, so it's getting, it's getting in the blood, so it's getting bacteremic, right? And it's right in your bloodstream to where? The heart. The heart, and then it sets up and you get endocarditis to the heart. This is the one I want you to know right here. For those two. Sorry for the pneumonia, is pneumococcal meningitis. Mortality rate higher than that of other cause of meningitis. You all should have been vaccinated with my part of this. Oh, yeah. So what are the two big, anybody know what the two big meningitis bacteria are? Don't tell me this one, I know it's right there. There's another bad one out there too. Well, meningitis is bad no matter how you look at it, but. Okay, we'll get you a little bit, I'll just wait, we'll get you a little bit. Remember that. This is so. If I ask, what's significant about meningitis caused by strep pneumonia? I want to be pneumococcal. What, what, what would the significance be? Oh, it causes uh, high rates of mortality. So the two we're going to talk about later on. These are the two that can kill you within days or hours, even. We want to look at later on that they've had deaths in, in short four hours after symptoms of which means what? Even this one's pretty quick. So what are the symptoms of meningitis? Flu. Are going to be clinicians? Flu-like symptoms? Lines, huh? Flu-like symptoms, stiff okay. neck. That gets the, towards the end, you get a stiff neck. The one big difference is a stiff neck, right? Mm-hmm. Searing mm-hmm. headache usually in the back is stiff neck. Yeah. Everything else is pretty much flu-like symptoms, right? Right. Are you going to go to the hospital with flu-like symptoms? No. Most people don't. A lot of times, by the time they get ready to go to the hospital, it's almost too late. Um, diagnosis again, gram state of sputum smears, you can find it in there. Treatment, um, penicillin still works pretty well, although there have been some resistant strains to it. Um, the vaccine is from the purified capsule because what did I say? I would write this down, those people who are here today. <clears throat> what did I say about it? Um, you make a vaccine in a capsule, you're going to be making what? Antibodies that are going to be able to oxidize that bacteria and grab it and pull it in. Do antibodies kill anything? No. No. They do not kill anything. They tag it, they mark it, they agglutinate, they inactivate. They do not kill anything. All right. So that's it for that. One thing you might want to know what do most people who die from influenza, what do they actually die of? Pneumonia. Okay, this can be intercoccus, previously classified as group D streptococci. Again, this is why the landscape grouping is starting to sort of fall apart. <clears throat> Reclassified as separate genus. All intercoccus live in the intestinal tracts of animals, including us. Including us. Alright. So I want you to know these two right here because these have some clinical significance. E. fecalis and E. fecum. Okay. Lactic capsule, short chains or pairs, pathogenesis found in the human colon. But what did I say about a lot of these opportunistic pathogens? As long as they stay what? Stay there, they're fine. As long as they stay where they're supposed to be, rarely pathogenic at this site. Can cause disease, you've introduced in other parts of the body, and important cause of healthcare associated infections. Write VRE underneath this. <clears throat> Put that on there. VRE stands for vancomycin resistant enterococcus. This is one of the three big ones you guys will be coming from. MRSA, MRSA, VRE, this is a big one actually. <clears throat> and C. diff, which is starting to show some resistance. Okay? But VRE, what's vancomycin? What was vancomycin traditionally? We well, talked about we're talking about antibiotics. Yeah, it's an antibiotic. So what was it back in the day? Wasn't it used for like babies or like um, no, that was a that was a little one. Mm-hmm. 
Vancomycin used to be the antibiotic of last choice. Last, so nothing else was working, they put you on vancomycin. Why is that? It's got some pretty rough side effects on it. Is that the synthetic or it's the? No, Vanco, I remember we're talking about. By, um, I think one of the streptomyces makes vancomycin. Yeah. So it's one of the, but it only works on gram positives. But in gram positive infections, it was one of last resort. So when you've got things like VRE and Versa, so now you've got Staph aureus and Enterococcus that are resistant to the last last available antibiotic, right? That's what you're last to problems. Now they've got a couple new ones out there that come, but now they're developing resistance to that. But this is the one that here. <clears throat> okay. Enterococcus distinguishable from F pneumonia by its sensitivity to bile. I would know that. Which one is sensitive to bile here? That sentence, the way it's worded, could be either way almost the way it's worded. Which one? <clears throat> In our okay, that's why that's, well, if you read that real quick, it would be, where do you find streptomoniae? The lungs. You find it in the gut. Really? Well, I guess since it works on mucus. Let's read back up and go the other direction then. Where do you find, exclusively find this stuff? In, 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 I hope not. You know that. That's not the kid on the wrong way. Where do you find, <laughs> where do you find the intercoccus guy? Just called intercoccus fetalis and intercoccus fecum. If those names don't give you a hint. Oh. The GI oh. tract. So what's inside the GI tract? Bile, right? So yeah, that's the difference. It's one of the ones you can grow in bile salt. <coughs> but this is what I said. Difficult to treat intercoccal infections. They're often resistant to most of the antibiotics out there. So the pneumonia is often sensitive to bile. Which one? The pneumonia? Yeah, it's, it's, it's sensitive to bile. Because if you remember, bile is pretty, bile is used in a lot of those um, selective medias to select for enterics. Because most organisms can't survive bile. It kills most of them. So remember the McConkie's auger guy? What were you looking for in the McConkie's auger? Okay. In Terry, so it's got bile in it, so almost everything else won't go on. Does that make sense? Look a little like your spectrum effect there. No, that's the aha thing there. Oh, that's the aha okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, again, you're going for a routine colonoscopy. They find a couple polyps. They start removing the polyps. They nick your colon. What happens next? It's a second there, you so what's going to maybe get inside your intraperitoneal cavity? Um, intercocci. Well, intercoccus now gets inside of there, it sets up an infection, gets resistant to everything out there. What's the next thing that happens? Infection. You might be calling a lawyer at that point, right? <laughs> <laughs> Prevention is difficult in healthcare settings. Guys, I want you just to know this one. This is one of the ones that's one of the big problems in. Patients often have weakened immune systems, which again, is going to be a double whammy, right? You got a vector, uh, antibiotic resistant organism, and you got immunocompromised patients. We'll just know that. All right, so on here, the ones I have in red <clears throat> are the ones I want you guys to know. So, myogenes. We're not going to worry about Agalecta or I don't think we're worried about the VC. I mean, you're really getting to decide. Mutans, which is what? The beard end group, which causes plaques. Pneumonia causes? Pneumonia. Good. We're getting there. Intercoccus fecalis, intercoccus fecum cause? Urinary er er tract infections, bacteria, endocarditis, and wound infections. All right, you good on those? What I want? Yeah. All right, bacillus. This is why I don't like calling Rob bacillus, because there's a whole genus bacillus. Okay, facultative anaerobes, which means? Um, this is why I'm being very careful with that soil you all brought in. They uh, work with. with they, won't, they, they can grow in there, <coughs> but they what? They prefer, they prefer nowhere. nowhere. Remember, it's the other way around. Almost everything's going to prefer air. Why? 
But they also have facultative aerobes. We didn't even go into that. Okay, we did a little more than we did. Facultative anaerobes, why would you prefer an aerobe versus no air? So you can use oxygen as an electron. And uh, you make way more what? Way more ATP. Remember that, guys. So these things switch from the electron transport system to fermentation. What happens to their ATP production? It drops. So they they would rather have their almost all of these ones. But say like Kersili, the impaired horn chain. This is one of the spore formers. Oh. <clears throat> Pathogenic strains produce anthrax. The three anthrax toxins. Hey, this is anthrax. Human contact from infected animals. You can get it. You need to know this about anthrax. This is the only bacillus we're going to go over. It's only really medically relevant one. Inhalation of spores, inoculation of spores through breaking the skin or ingestion. Where did this become of importance when you guys were about three? They were saying it's the bread and the net, right? When? Which time? When I wasn't three, I was. You're a little older than you. What, what, when did this become, when did this get in the meat, you guys? Oh no, when they were sending it to the, to, yeah. After Obama, 9 Obama, yeah. The second part, oh, part. <laughs> the second part of 9-11, the big thing was the anthrax that were being sent to the president. Yeah, I wasn't three. Of, uh, huh? <laughs> I wasn't three years old. <laughs> he took me back. I was like, oh. Uh, president, a bunch of senators, the news media, and everything else. That's the problem with this right here. <clears throat> what, does this look, what does this look like to you? This is lung tissue. <clears throat> this is going to be bacillus. <clears throat> Artificially colored. I think they colored it. Looks like thinning. Yeah, it does. What? Looks like thinning. The sopa, the soup. Like the soup, like you know how you have like estrellas, like you have stars, it's like a tomato soup. Oh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. There's like a the tomato, you can get like Mexican restaurants. Oh, okay. That's what it looks like to me. What does it look like to That's okay. What else does it look like? <laughs> what does it look like? Takis. Takis. What? Takis. <laughs> looks like ground beef to me. Have you ever seen that? Oh, oh yeah. I don't like the pictures. I just don't want to eat a hamburger for all yeah. <laughs> All right. Three clinical manifestations. These go with the roots of administration. Gastrointestinal anthrax is rare in humans. More common in grazing animals. They're out grazing. They can they can ingest the spores. I mean, yeah, ingest the spores. They'll get uh, a little bit of it. Uh, gastrointestinal anthrax. Unless you're out grazing in a field, you're going to be pretty safe from this one. Inhalation of anthrax spores. This is rare in humans. Requires inhalation of airborne endospores. This has about an 80 plus mortality rate even with treatment. I want to go back and tell you why in a second. Okay. This is something, the way things are going these days, you guys may see this coming up, right? Because what are bioweapons? What's the nickname for the bioweapons? Um, mm -hmm. It's called the poor man uh, weapon of mass destruction, or poor country's weapon of mass destruction, because Anybody with the right instruments could go out, dig up soil, and you could start growing these things. What? Okay. The difference, I'll tell you why it's important that. Cutaneous anthrax produces these ulcers called eschars. Okay? And it's still got about a 20% fatality rate with that untreated. The worst one is what? Inhalation. Inhalation. So these are those eschars right there. So these spores got into the skin, they germinate, and they start producing anthrax. Between that and the ground beef, Ugh. <laughs> All right, diagnosis, large non-modal gram positive bacilli in the lung or skin samples. Fortunately, many antibiotics are effective against the anthracis. Tetracycline works great. Two things I want to go to about this. It's, it's going to be important and it's happening for you guys. Prevention is controlled disease in animals. <laughs> Anybody here at military? Do you have the anthrax vaccine? Yeah. What did you think of it? It sucked. <laughs> yes, general consensus I get. Yeah. And there's some question as to its efficacy too, right? Yeah. That's how it really works. Why does it suck? The pain, the crap that it leaves on these things yeah. oozing, and oh. you got to stay away from everybody. And yeah. The question is, the question is, does it really even work that well? That's the big thing. 
right. So, what did I want to talk about? How can we not all die from anthrax? Because it's in the soil and you got spores everywhere. Dust is kicking up. We were talking about toxidia mycosis before, right? Rift Valley fever. Yeah, Rift Valley fever. Rift Valley is how come we're not all dying from it? If you guys think. Mm -hmm. I was not there on Saturday night. <laughs> what is it? How come? Speculate. Vaccine. Well, vaccine. We don't Our immune system. Huh? Our immune well, once it gets in there, boy, it germinates, bam. Well, because, I mean, it need don't we take showers? Because mm -hmm. of, like, taking showers or we wash our hands or sanitize, it kind of washes well, What about, it? like, homeless people? The, the problem is spores have to get deep down inside of your lungs to really be bad. Mm -hmm. And they're really, in nature, they're pretty big. They like to stick together and there's all these other... Are spores trying to make you sick? No. They're no, just trying to survive. To do what? Survive. To survive. So they didn't evolve to make you sick. It's just something that has happened over time. Or revolution. So it's pretty hard to get down to something. When they do bioweapons, when they make them out of bioweapons, they have <clears throat> they work to make sure the spores are as small as they can get them, and they usually put them in that white powder to keep them from sticking together, oh. and then allows them. Do you what are you? You're TV, right? You're working with. What are you working with? No, yeah. With Astra? No, no, I don't think that. TV, okay, yeah, TV, right? Yeah. So they, they try and make them, so they put them in that powder so it'll aerosolize and it'll get down inside your lungs. Oh. So in general, inhalation anthrax is incredibly rare. You've got to do some work on it to weaponize it. Second part, the problem with anthrax is once you become symptomatic for it, it's not the infection that kills you, it's the three toxins that are produced. And if you get the anthrax inside of your lungs, it starts growing, and producing the toxins, even though you start antimicrobial therapy, a lot of times it's too late because you've already got the toxins that are doing the damage. So they're trying to come up with some vaccines against the toxins now because they're working on. Third one, and this drives me crazy, is what is that antibiotic everybody wants to take these days? It may not be as bad as it was in the, in the 2000s. Well, Cipro. Anybody ever heard of Cipro? No. Yeah. Everybody Is wants Cipro when they go in there? Z or an S? Uh, C. C? Yes, Cipro. Ciprofloxin. Uh, it's one of the levofloxin. Actually, I'm trying to get away from it now because it causes. Does anybody know what it causes? The levofloxin antibiotics side effects? It causes your ligaments. can cause your ligaments to pop, basically. Huh. Kind of bad. But... <clears throat> and this is what happens. You got to give me the front line of this patient coming in asking for this, 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 and this, right? After the 9-11, everybody wanted Cipro. They had all these things with Cipro out there because Cipro works on every single strain of anthrax. <clears throat> Tetracycline works on every single strain of anthrax except one that was developed to be resistant to Cipro. So because of the media and everything, everybody in the world, the general public, thought Cipro was this magic antibody that cures everything. And every time they went in for anything, they wanted Cipro. It turned out, it's actually got some pretty bad side effects. I've got this old friend of mine, yeah, he's old, he's actually old, he's a friend of me old. Every time he goes in because of this, what does he ask the doctor for? He wants Cipro for everything. All right, Clostridium, anaerobic endospore from bacillus. These are obligate anaerobes. They're ubiquitous in the soil, water, <coughs> intestinal tract of animals and humans. They're spore formers. <clears throat> Why would it be advantageous for soil bacteria to be spore formers? Because the different the changes in the environment, it gets hot and cold, so it's it better. hot and cold and dry, and things happen. We're gonna go through about four of them. I want you to know clostridium per frenzy. You may see this one. Large non-moral bacillus, clostridium most frequently isolated from clinical specimens. <clears throat> I kind of question that. I guess I don't have any word. Produces toxin that causes irreversible damage to the body. Grows in digestive tracts in animals and humans. You can get food poisoning. From here on out, guys, almost every one of these things will give you food poisoning. 
diarrhea. Food poison, abdominal cramps, watery diarrhea. This is a big one right here. Gas gangrene. You used to see it in wartime all the time. Did we talk about it in here with the spores? Anybody ever talked about it at all? Anybody ever smell gangrene? Mm -mm. It's got a very unique and horrible smell. All right. So trauma introduces endospores into the body. They're strict anaerobes, so once the spores germinate, they cause necrosis. But what kind of wound do you have to have for this to happen? Hmm? Deep, but you did not, but not open. Why not open? Because of the air. Because you don't want air in there, right? These are straight anaerobes. So these are going to be puncture wounds. Something that with a wound track, as it goes back toward the skin, is going to close up behind it. Bullet wounds tend to do this. This is why they had a lot of it in, in, during wars. Knife wounds can do this. Any sort of penetrating wounds. If a knife goes in and it comes back out, what happens to the wound track? Oh, I see what you're saying. It's going to close around it and set up an animal over your face. Right here. The problem with gas gangrene and the toxins is this is done. It's irreversible wound damage. It will not grow back. So even if you were to cut it all off and try to let it heal, it's not going to heal. So this guy's well. This guy's already lost his toe. You're going to lose this toe and this toe. You probably would do what? What do you guys think? The foot. Hmm? Cut the foot. The foot. Yeah, they're probably going to take all the toes, but I can't sit up. They're going to take it. Because they can cut like half of this foot, maybe. Yeah, they probably would, mm -hmm. probably would do that. You can't see the rest. Well, I don't know if it's going to be worth that. Kind of thing. How about this person up here? That toe's a goner. How about that one? Yeah. He might just keep his feet. Like uh, this one? Yeah, it's done. Yeah, that one? Well, that, one down, that might star up around the side of it. Problem is, if you cut this one off and you cut that one off and you leave this one from here, he's going to walk around like he's flipping everybody off. Really. <laughs> <laughs> so, why? So, if deep wounds and um, it needs it to be closed behind it because of the oxygen, it doesn't like oxygen. Right. Why diabetes? Why is that common? Yeah, that's a good question. Why do diabetics get gangrene? I know, like, the damage is happening from the inside, but. Is that why? Is it something with nerves? Can be with it can be with nerve. It can be vascular or nerve with diabetics. There's three different types of gangrene. That's the difference. Oh. There's gas gangrene or wet gangrene, which is this right here. This is caused by clostridium. Okay. Then you have dry and wet gangrene, which is caused by nerve damage, vascular damage, and ischemia and things like that. That's oh, what I'm like. Okay, gotcha. And that's what we'll be more exposed to. It's like that kind of those kind of wounds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hopefully that you kind of gangrene. To this. But I know I, I had two students before that worked. They were correctional officers. They wouldn't say where. I'm a little concerned about that. <laughs> <laughs> but they said they both experienced patients with gas gangrene. And they said it was horrible. Just everybody I've ever talked to that smelled it is just terrible. <clears throat> All right, talk training for frangies. Uh, that one. Persistence, <clears throat> presence of mineral bacterial load in food or feces. Again, guys, if your fingers start turning black and falling off, it's pretty much diagnostic for gangrene and starts to smell real bad. Food poisoning should be self limiting. Again, gas, green, gas, gang, gas gangrene requires removal of the dead tissue, administering of the antitoxins to stop them from doing damage, and administration of antibiotics to stop them from growing. So, all three things, I want you to know that part. All right, see diff. You guys will you come across this, one. I guarantee. Mobile anaerobic intestinal bacteria produce two toxins and hyaluronidates. Common member of the intestinal tract. As far as I know, everybody has it. I don't know of anybody that doesn't. Okay? It's an opportunistic pathogen taking what? Broad spectrum. Broad spectrum antimicrobial drugs. So you knock down that competition. Always there, so it's going to be a secondary infection or a super infection. It's already there. Secondary. Super infection. Oh, I'm calling the super infection. It's already growing there. Then it comes blaring up. Okay. Minor infections result in what? 
the way you're going to come across it. Self-limiting explosive oh, diarrhea. Oh, jeez. <laughs> what is explosive diarrhea? Does that mean gas come down when you do it? <laughs> Smoke come out? What is it? What's the difference between regular diarrhea and explosive diarrhea? Shooting out. It's not a self-explosive. The pressure. Well, of it coming it, out. Everybody said diarrhea. Well, pretty much right. Everybody said diarrhea, right? Yeah, you guys are going to have to learn to deal with food. They're going to be finishing. Like Most times you have diarrhea, you're like, okay, I've got to do it like that, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Both of diarrhea with stuff like this, you'd be like, so, tomorrow we're going to have boom. Kind <laughs> 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 of the difference. It comes on really fast. You get a lot of building and gas and stuff in there. Have you had this? No, I've never had it, thank God. No? <laughs> self-limiting is going to go away by itself without treatment. Oh, okay. So the idea is, you're going <laughs> to leave the house for a day or two. You probably wouldn't have that. <laughs> or wear some penny or something. All right, serious cause, this is the one you guys are going to have to deal with. Pseudomembranous colitis. Okay? So what happens if it, gets, it starts to overgrow, you start getting inflammation of the lining of your colon. If the inflammation gets too bad, it can actually cause sections of the colon wall to slough off. Whoa. So now you just breach the colon again. And now all those enterococcus fecalis, enterococcus vegum, E. coli, clostridium, they've all gotten access to where? Your body. Inside of your gut. And this is the big problem right here. This is a life-threatening condition. And there are new strains that are becoming antimicrobial resistant. That's the problem. Do you think a lot of the flora in our body gets resistant to antibiotics because maybe you take some yeah, takes I mean, a lot of it and they just get exposed to it? Right. So so that's what we're talking about. You said you've never been on antibiotics, right? But you remember. Anybody else? Are there two people in here? <clears throat> That, that would be for sure. So when, you're kind of, when you take the antibiotics, are all of them absorbed? All of them are? You get 100% absorption? No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I mean, it's not your body. So you're going to have some that are going to, and some of them are going to be excreted through the feces also. And then you get this thing that's called interhepatic circulation. Anyway, yes. <laughs> so I don't want to get there. So then anyone's going to get to be completely different from another person's, I mean. Yeah. Okay. Because depending on what they've been on, what they've been exposed to. Because the antibiotics are killing off, well, exactly right here. What happened? This, this is showing you right here. <coughs> you're taking broad spectrum antibiotics, right? Yeah. So now you're killing off everything except for the clostridium, which is pretty resistant. And it's bad to see it back. Um, right here, yeah. Uh, I remember asking a while back in lab about how when they said in a clinical setting, if you have, if a patient has C. diff, like you should, like, Use hand sanitizer or yeah. something like that? What? Like, I, don't, I don't understand. Do so they want, A, it's becoming resistant to C. diff, so you don't want to make sure you're not passing that on to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Oh, they don't want to use hand sanitizer? Or do yeah, they? yeah. They do. Oh, why, why, why would you not, why would hand sanitizer not work? So C. diff. Spores? Huh? Exactly. Okay. It's going to be spores. That, that, wait, it's really good at killing bacteria. Does it do anything to spores? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's probably what they were talking about. So they say wash your hands as opposed to using oh, hand sanitizer. Yeah. Wash your hands as opposed to um, Okay, diagnosis. You guys said for the feces, you don't have to worry about that. This is my favorite right here. What's the treatment options? Discontinue. Discontinue causing that's on my proto drug to resolve minor infections. Serious diseases are treated with what? Antibiotic. More antibiotics. <laughs> They didn't write this very well. The difference is it was caused by broad spectrum, right? Oh. Treatment with antibiotics would be narrow spectrum. They find one that's typical for antibiotics, oh, okay. something like maybe yeah. mechamycin or cool. So is this when they tell you start taking these antibiotics but also get some probiotic yogurt and stuff? Right, yeah. And, get and, and there's some bacteria. Yeah. yeah. Now there's some studies on whether that really helps or not. You should have a little taste on that. I don't want to go back to look at that. I had a student one time, he ended up in the hospital for a while because they said that. Um, he would eat yogurt every day and that it caused some kind of... Well, that was one of the problems with probiotics. Some people were actually getting sick and they were taking too many of them. Yeah, it was a probiotic. It was, his mom was one of those. Yeah, but, it, but yogurt, same thing. Yeah. Are you supposed to... Can you have probiotics when you're on that Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
In fact, some people, some of the people recommend trying to keep repopulating your GI tract with the good antibody, the good bacteria, um, because you're killing it off with the antibiotics. So you're trying to, it's like a preventative measure. To avoid C. Yeah, but the paper I read said it didn't seem to really help that much. But is it going to hurt? No. I would to do it. I would. I would do it. Because you want to make sure you. It's certainly not going to hurt. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. All those take a little bit longer than time to do that. Okay, so. Oh, there's my off the other. All right. <laughs> um, what are the other two treatments for this now that are very effective? Very effective. You guys will see this for sure. Because it doesn't require antibiotics. Oh. Hmm? Cleansing everything out? No. No, no isn't no. it that yeah, one? You don't want to do that in Do you want to? Don't they take um, donor? Fecal yeah, transplant. that's what I was thinking. Called fecal transplant. Yeah. And yes, that's it's exactly insane. what you think it is, and it's exactly how it happens. Ugh. <clears throat> they take feces from a healthy volunteer that have really good flora. They introduce it into the colon, and it works very well. Yeah. They you know, twice they have this like interview for a guy, and he gets like tons of money. Donate. Donated species? Yeah. yeah, you probably got a really good flora that they like. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw it on Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> time. What is the other newer one that has been approved for use in Europe and not approved for use in the U.S. just yet? Oh. Um. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> uh. Been approved for use in Europe but not the U.S. Pending approval in the U.S. It might be there when you all get here. You might be able to administer this to your patients. Here you go. Here's your aspirin. Your, your poopy fecal. Pill, <laughs> called the poopy pill. They actually take a little piece of feces from these people back at the gentleman council. Yes, hopefully clean it up a little bit. Yeah. And give it to you. It actually works very well too. Fecal. You don't know, want to take a pill ball poop? Alright, oh just put this in so it may not be in yours. Oh. I'll sit back on this every morning. <laughs> So here's the normal colon, there's pseudomembranous colitis. You see all the yellow in there? All this inflammatory response? When it gets too bad, that tissue just starts to get necrotic and slough off. And it's just bacterial overgrowth. And that can't go, it can go away. Okay. Can what? Uh, my, I'm sorry, my husband's grandmother has uh, ulcerative colitis. And oh, that's different. Ulcerative colitis, but colitis. Inflammation. Inflammation of the colon. So ulcerative colitis, colitis is, is when you start getting ulcers in there, that's usually... Oh, and that will never go. Yeah, that's, what that's usually an autoimmune disease like that. Not necessarily, uh, but... Yeah. Well, that makes sense. No, that's inflammatory bowel disease. That's like ulcerative colitis. I think it might be too. She's in her 90s. 90s? Yeah. She's good. Yeah. All right. She's really cool. So, subtrative botulinum, what is his cause? Botulism. Botulism. Common in soil and water, botulism results when the endospores germinate and produce botulism toxin. Botulism toxin strains produce seven. It is now 12, not seven. Maybe we 14. I have to look it up, but there's at least 12. Distinct toxins you can scratch out among on your thing because they are the deadliest toxins known to man. Period. It binds the neurons and prevents muscle contractions. So your neurons release acetylcholine, right? Yeah. Everybody remember that? Yeah. And that causes your muscles to do what? Contract. Contract. Botulism toxin binds to the inner of the neuron, the axons, prevents the vesicles from dumping out acetylcholine, which means you get what? Well, I have paralysis, which means you can't, can't. But not the original one. It's called the flaccid one, where you can't. Your muscles don't contract. How are you going to die from this? You okay. can't breathe. You can't. Which one? <clears throat> What's going to be the primary cause of death for you if you're out in the wilderness? You get to the hospital, you'll probably be okay. <clears throat> I think it's respiratory. So you're going to be paralyzed, right? Yeah. So what's the first thing? Cardiac tissue tends to beat on its own a little bit better, right? Yeah. It doesn't have to have that iteration. I think it's respiratory. <clears throat> it's diaphragm. You get paralysis of the diaphragm, you can't breathe, you have respiratory failure. Yeah. 
Okay. Foodborne botulism can result from asphyxiation because of paralysis of the diaphragm. Solar recovery is growth of nerve cell endings. The nerve cell endings will die and they can regrow. So you can get over this. This I didn't know about. Results from ingestion of endospores, paralysis, and death are rare. I had no idea you weren't supposed to give babies honey. <laughs> Good thing I didn't have one. Right? <laughs> You're not. You're not supposed to. Do they tell you that? You yes. Kid? Yeah. They tell you, okay. I'm like, well, that might be some good information. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they do tell you. I'll give my kid here, have some money. <laughs> well, and then <laughs> when they tell you not to expose them to egg. Well, when my son was 15 years ago, yeah. not not to expose them to egg, peanut butter, honey, and other things. But now, things are people are saying that you should expose them little by little so that they build up an immunity to. Right. So the, the difference with the peanut butter now is what. You're supposed to give it to your kids yeah. because you want them to develop a normal immune response to it, not an allergic immune response to it. Yeah, I mean, but I don't get that because I ate peanut butter my whole life until I was like 27, and then I asphyx almost asphyxiated. I became allergic to it. Some people get a dull onset allergy. I don't. Know it's why. like crazy, yeah. and now I can't. Yeah, I'm very, very allergic yeah, to it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this was weird. Yeah. Because honey is usually considered to be antimicrobial, right? What's the difference, though? Huh? Why is this? Why is botulism then a problem? What did they go back to again? Is it the bacteria that's in there? What's in the honey? Nope. No, it's not, that can be a that can be other one, but in this case, you find I'm just the endospores. So the baby's gonna eat the endospores, and the spores are gonna be killed by the honey, and then they'll germinate inside the gut. You get gastrointestinal. The other one you're talking about is an anaerobic spaces, and I'll end up finish up with this and we'll let you guys go. Mm. You guys ready for the test? Yeah. Yeah. Shouldn't be that different. I don't think she'd be that bad. Um, so there was a restaurant on Yarborough and Trayway. Right? Oh. That German one? Nope, it's been gone for a while. It was actually, I think it was an Indian restaurant. But they had these little potatoes yeah. that were in olive oil. So you, where do potatoes grow? In the ground. Where do bots of them grow? In the ground. So it produces four. So whatever happened, they didn't cook the potatoes, they probably just boiled them, because I didn't know if you kill them, of course. No. They put little potatoes in the olive oil, they served it as a salad. Between the olive oil and the potatoes, set up a nice anaerobic space. The spores germinated, they produced botulism toxin, and they gave, I think, 12 people, I think, 12 different people botulism. I think one person may have passed away. I actually knew a person who ate there and got it. <gasps> And she got paralysis on the left side of her face and down um, part of her arm. It, it went away. It, grows, it goes away. It doesn't kill you. The nerve endings regrow. So you're usually okay. She's fine. She's willing to be done with She went to work for customs, I think, mean, later on. She had to do something. That's great. Uh, the restaurant is no longer there. That happened in the 2000s, right? I think I was like in high school. Uh, uh, maybe, like the late 90s, maybe? I remember being in high school. Yeah. I heard about in high school this. Yeah, I think it was in 93. It had to be in 93, 94, 95, somewhere around there. Yeah. All right, guys. If you have any questions, any specific questions? Any tips for the test? Anything we should? Okay. How many extra credit points are we at right now? Like four? Uh, <laughs> oh, well, I need to add those in, too. Oh, this yeah. is my whole thing. This, a lot of this was just mm -hmm. right? Just yeah. don't confuse. Let's give it a mechanical vector and just a vector. Well, a biological vector, mechanical vector. What's the difference? Well, the vector, vector kind of has to do with like biting of like an animal, and then uh -huh. just mechanical is like just through a fly. It just kind like of blocking. It's just moving in through mm -hmm. passively moving on the body. What is water? What would that be? Mechanical. Yeah. It's called a vehicle, right? All right, guys, let me get out here. But isn't it like, like sneezing and stuff? It has to be past like a meter, right? Okay. If it is less than a meter, is it droplet or airborne? Droplet. 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 droplet.
If it's more than a meter or it's just there for a long time, it's going to be airborne. Because I forgot to do it. I'm going to do it. 